Are we on? We are yeah, on? Yeah, we're on. There you go. Okay. Everyone, thank you for joining us for the first in-person edition of Vox News Eucharist after this long time when we spent times at home and we didn't meet in person. Hope you enjoyed the conference and you enjoyed this last talk as well. I'm Ana Maria Michalciano. I'm a Java developer advocate at Oracle and together with my colleague. Yeah, I'm Nikolai, also Java developer advocate at Oracle. And we're going to talk about... <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, they have the beer. <laughs> Amazing. So, <laughs> I'm a good colleague. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to talk about uh, Project Amber and the solution factory to Java's problems because, oh my God, does Java have problems? It's slow, it's old, it's verbose. <laughs> anyway, it's cumbersome, no fun, and none of that is true, but none of that is entirely false either. So if we take a more nuanced look, we'll actually notice that there are some places where Java definitely lacks expressiveness, where, um, for example, strings don't work, always work the way we intend them to. The type system and encapsulation can get in the way. And dealing with data is clunky. And getting started with Java as a new developer also isn't all that easy. And the solution factor to these problems is Project Amber. The claim is smaller productivity-oriented Java language features. And the slides are online already. I will show you a link later. And everything green on these slides is something you can click on. For example, the project page, the wiki, the mailing list. This project was launched uh, six years ago at this point, and Brian Getz was leading it for the longest time, and I think he still officially is, but Gavin Bierman is doing so much good work that I just decided to put him on the slide as also leading the project. Mm -hmm. The important part to understand about Project Amber is that it's not just about syntax sugar. Actually, it's not all about syntax sugar. It's not about finding the one place where you think, like, this crazy new feature would make my workflow 5% easier. It has these effects, but these are beneficiary side effects. What it's aiming for is identifying these situations where Java does lack, ex lack expressiveness and where some of its strengths can turn into weaknesses and where there are like, tensions and trade-offs built in that we have to deal with. If you saw Venk Venkat's uh, keynote this morning, he talked a lot about trade-offs. The best way to deal with the trade-off is to make it go away, to not have to make the decision anymore and resolve those tensions for the greater good. And just to make a note, Project Amber is not at all the only project that is dealing with that. Viewed through this lens, most of the big projects that are currently being worked on in the Java space to make it better are working on that exact theme, on these tensions that need to be resolved. Valhalla tries to resolve the tension between good design and high performance. Loom wants to resolve the tension between simple code and scalable code. Panama between safe and secure code, in the sense, you know, not using unsafe, not tramping all over the memory, and also writing uh, performant and easy to read uh, and, safe, uh, and flexible code. And finally, Leiden, maybe new in this list, tries to find a balance or tries to remove the tension between optimizing the code and running code that supports all of Java. So this is what we're going to over go over today. So we're going to look at strings. We're going to look at type safety and encapsulation. We're going to look at dealing with data. And for those of you who have been at my talk yesterday, you might know that section. You're not allowed to fall asleep. Um, and we're going to look at, last, at starting with Java because the thing is, there will be a test later, and all of this will be on it. So, no sleeping allowed. There you go. Yes, I told Nikolai that we as Romanians love a lot the surprise test in school. Um, it's not so a surprise. It was <laughs> announced, but anyway. Uh, yeah, let's start with strings. And what Project Ember enhanced on probably the most uh, used type in Java. There are a few issues when using strings. I mean, there are certain cases when using strings is not as comfortable as with other data types. And let's take, for example, the snippet of code. If we're looking here, we're pretty much having the representation of a JSON as a string. And what we're trying to express here, well, obviously, we are ex expressing a string. That's the good part. It's a good thing. But then, we need to express this JSON on multiple lines. We think that probably it's easier to read it like that or for our colleagues to understand it later on. And you can see it becomes a little bit cumbersome as it goes on multiple lines with the pluses and the slash ands at the end. But we also want to have some indentation, so we add some backslash t. It becomes a little, little less readable. Then, well, it's a JSON, uh, and we also need some quotation marks for the keys and the values. So we should have some escapes for those quotation marks. And last but not least, we would like to embed also some variables. And that's why more pluses for our variables. Well, again, difficult to read and to embed all this 
together in just a string. However, we're doing this, or we were doing this in our day-to-day -day life to express data like this. To summarize a little bit the string issues in this case, was that the string literals are lacking expressiveness. There is no concept for multi-lineless by default the strings. There was no concept for interpolation or for processing and for rawness, but hopefully Project Amber is fixing that, but without like all at once. So let's start with the beginning, multi-lineless. Text blocks, probably some of you already have used them. We're introduced in Java 13, finalized in Java 15. You can find the Japanese slides 378. And thanks to text blocks, you can use multi-line string literals. And you can now use Java uh, to um, have this kind of representation when it makes a distinction between the incidental versus essential indentation. For example, incidental like code formatting, and essential desired indentation. Now, le a lesson learned in Java when uh, working with indentation is that Java keeps only the essential indentation. And of course, requires less escaping. You can see that there's no more backslashes to escape the quotes. Just simple as that. So now we have multi-lineless embedded, but we still have one issue. I mean, a few issues. Embedding variables, that stayed. So how do we embed variables? Like how do we simplify this? Well, one way to still work with text blocks and still embed variables is by using format. So we are using the um, a percentage S and percentage D to format the string that is in the text block and introduce our variables there. But some of you might think that this is still cumbersome and this is not easy and maybe it could be easier. And you're right. Maybe it could be easier because perhaps in Java 21, the string templates may be previewed. That's Jeff 430, was recently promoted. And in this job, it is said that it allows embedding expressions and understanding the need for explicit processing for validation and escaping. So embedding expression becomes like a standard. Sorry, I have pointed to the wrong one. Embedding expression it becomes like a standard. Uh, processing it, like validation and escaping, um, is again, uh, they're, po uh, they're possible. And now we can have variable embedding looking much more easier to read without any formatted on our strings. Let's take a closer look to the string templates and how are those composed. So the string templates are composed of two parts. The template expression that has the template, the embedded expression, what is be between the three quotation marks, and the template processor the one that is converting the string template in our case to a string. So it's the STR. The STR is a singleton class instance that has a method called process on it and performs a stateless interpolation. So hence the uppercase field name. But why are we focusing that much on strings? Because most of the time in our application we're working with data. So we're kind of converting that data to string then we want, because we want to validate or sanitize something, and we know that string class allows, to do that, allows us to do that, then we can simplify data to string. We can always use the two-string method, probably. And then after we're done with manipulating that data, we can parse again to JSON object, XML, or whatever we needed to like pass that data furthermore. But this is kind of sounding like a detour for our data. Could it be easier? Yes, with custom templating. So. In this job, you can find the interface processor that can take any, um, that can take a string template and return any type of data. Result can be your data type, the one that you need, so that's no more needing for so many detours to process data. How would that look like in terms of processing JSONs? So in our case, it would be some uh, JSON processor called JSON that you would define that takes, of course, a template, or an SQL processor that, again, takes a template and returns a statement query. Simple like that. Not out just only less lines of code, but more readability um, and more simplicity for our code. Speaking of rawness, because that was another miss that probably some of you wanted, or many of us actually needed in Java. Raw strings were proposed in Java 12. However, before um, that coming to maturity, were withdrawn because a lot of folks gave us a the feedback, they're too complex. Some of the things from that JEP 
were ported into the uh, JEP4 um, text blocks in Java 13, but there are parts that are still needed. For example, the regular expressions. Probably many of you have worked with regular expressions. Um, many of you love them as much as many developers in this world. Um, and in a regular expression, you typically have a syntax that's kind of cumbersome. For example, you can see here the double backslash, then of course some um, pattern there, and that makes it a little too difficult to understand. That's just a simple syntax. Imagine even further more complexity for a regex. What could make this simple, and this is just a made up syntax to make this simple, we hope that this will be enabled in the future, is to have like maybe slash, um, way less backslashes. That would be awesome. So, just to summarize, Java strings are essential to development. They're not enough expressive, but Project Ember introduces new features that can help us work with strings and make those more expressive, thanks to string templates. And we have Java has learned from other languages as well and has combined only what is needed to make things better for us as Java developers. Let's go again. Okay, let's talk about the next thing on the list, type safety and encapsulation. Here, Project Amber wants to tackle the tension between being explicit and safe versus not being too verbose. So let's start with a little recap on type safety. What does it mean? What does it mean in Java? Java is strongly typed. That means every variable, type, method argument, every method return, all of those has a specific type attached to it. And it's statically typed, meaning all of that is visible at compile time. It's visible in the source code. So with the types that we create ourselves, we're also usually inclined to use encapsulation meaning that all our types, fields, and methods, we make them as low visible as possible, right? Yes, who starts with public? Okay, at least the people who wanted to raise their hands knew they were not supposed to, good. Um, <laughs> right, uh, and then we hide internals, ideally behind actual domain logic, and you know, in worst case, just behind accessors, but at least we try to hide them. And that's great, right? That's a great approach to uh, model our domains, to turn larger problems into smaller problems, um, to catch errors early and generally write readable, understandable code. And also to understand the code that we're looking at. I know when I started writing JavaScript, it was driving me insane that I just get a function that takes a user and I couldn't look up what user actually is or what properties it has. To many of us, these types are crucial to understanding code. But they don't come for free. They can be verbose, there can be redundancy in there, and that sometimes inclines us to not use the type system to the maximum effect because we're trying to like, you know, set characters, trying to you know, generate hundreds of lines of code or type those even worse. And let's remember back to, to lambdas, we noticed that lambdas tackled that problem as well. Now the interesting thing is that lambdas did not allow anything new, right? You could already do, not the syntax, but you could already pass behavior. You just had to create an anonymous class of an interface, anonymous implementation of an interface with the full method body, this one liner would have been like seven lines of code. So what Lambdas really did was not so much enable something new, it was focusing on what's essential, and that is the behavior on the right-hand side and the semantics, it's a person, it doesn't matter what exact type it is. But of course, it does remove some, uh, remove lots of verbosity, but it does remove some explicitness. Maybe I do wanna know what type person is, and now the developer put it there, wrote, wrote the code, didn't put that type there. So what Lambdas did, it found a better balance between those, I mean, this tension in a specific situation at least. And it allowed us, or not even allowed us, it invited us to pass more code as data because it was less of a hurdle there. And Project Amber wants to do more of that. It wants to give up in certain situations some small amounts of the benefits to in return get a lot of new features, new semantics, and overall make the code more succinct and more expressive. Java 10 introduced var. That was the first step into that direction. So as you can see here, the person on the right-hand side, that's the important expression. That is an audience member. That's the important variable name. We don't need to repeat the person here. We get what we needed. So we focus on what's essential, remove verbosity and redundancy, and we get more readable variable names. Not only do we get hopefully more readable names, but we also get more variables ideally because it's cheaper to create them. They line nicely, they make nice code nice to read. Um, so by changing this balance, it hopefully unlocks um, a different set of programming that gives us a little bit, or well not different style, but a different approach to this variable naming and um, variable creation um, that, al that uh, lets us create more of those so they become more, the code becomes more readable. The next step was records in Java 16. It's probably the most obvious step in this direction, right? You create a record person here, and imagine there was a class 
person, open curly brace, that part makes sense. Now if you create a record, you also have this weird thing here, which is a list of the components. You're creating a record with the components name and birthday, and what you get is essentially a class with two fields, name and birthday, with a constructor that takes these two arguments, two accessors, hash code, two string, all of the good stuff. What we're doing here is we're creating a transparent carrier for immutable data. We're opting out of encapsulation. We're explicitly saying, okay, I don't need encapsulation for this. It's great in general, but here I don't want it. And the benefit we get is that the compiler actually understands the internals of this class. It's not just the colleagues and us. The compiler can understand the internals, and that becomes very important very soon. But it also, and that's the most obvious advantage, reduces verbosity a lot. Because all the stuff that I just said that the compiler generates for us, I don't need to type it out anymore. And even if you don't type it out, you let your IDE generate it, it's still something that I might have to read to make sure it's really just the boilerplate equals and not you didn't do something fancy in there. So that allows us to create simpler types and then again, hopefully more types. There are more situations where we don't use a pair or a map entry or something, where we can actually use like meaningful types with meaningful names. Um, for the next step, I want to take a quick detour through pattern matching. Um, this is possible in uh, Java 16, Java 16, and that down there will hopefully be final in Java 21. What we're doing is here, we're creating, we have an object from somewhere, and we're making an instance object. Is object a person? <coughs> and if it is, we get a variable called person. You know, and then we can do stuff with it. In this case, apparently what I care about is not so much the person, I only care about the name and the birthday. I want to take it apart. And as I said earlier, the compiler understands the internals. So we can make good use of that. This will probably be final in Java 21. It's already in preview. You can already try it out with the enable preview feature, uh, enable preview flag. I'm saying object instance of person, and then I add the components here. So I'm saying, look, if it's a person indeed, take the record apart. I know what the record looks like. The compiler knows what the record looks like. So we can use name and birthday immediately. So again, what this does is it removes, re it removes borderline redundant, or at least very boilerplate code, and instead lets us focus on what's essential. If it's a person, I want to take it apart. Now, if you think that's crazy, let's take a look at this. So I'm fetching a person from wherever, and then I want to get the name and the birthday out. But what about this? Couldn't I do what I did earlier in the pattern, just on assignment? And there is no Java, no JDK enhancement proposal yet, but Brian Getz said on Twitter, where all the open JDK news get announced, that this is indeed coming. So what will the syntax specifically is made up. But the idea here is that fetch person returns the record. So I can just immediately construct it and say, like, I don't care about the person. Give me the name at the birthday, and then I can start using it. And it gets better, worse, more interesting. It depends probably on your viewpoint. I think this is super interesting, um, which is you want to change start, you want to change a field in a record. I get this person, and I want to set the name to the empty string. Now a record is immutable, so I cannot have a setter. So what could I do? Well, I can just call the constructor, right? I can just call the constructor, ename all the old person's properties except the one that I want to change and pass that. And I can do that, but once I've written like 100 of those, I'm probably wondering, couldn't I do this like a method on the person? And you could. In functional programming languages, it's totally usual to instead of have like a set method, you have a with method. So you don't say set name, you say with name, and that gives you back a new person with all the same fields except the name is changed. But in Java, that would not be necessary. The compiler understands that a record consists of a name and a birthday, and it knows how to take those apart and put them back together. So we might get a with expression if that ends up with the name, which means take person apart, assign a name and a birthday variable, then in this block I can reassign those, and at the end of the block, the compiler gets called and gets put back together. And I don't need to, I need to write zero code for that. And the reason why that works it's not some magic. It's a natural consequence on, uh, of us giving up encapsulation. So that's really, really important here. While type safety and encapsulation are the bedrocks of Java, and we will keep using them all day, every day, they aren't free. And if we strategically give up on these benefits, or at least parts of those benefits, like a little bit of explicitness in the declarations by using lambdas or var, or encapsulation entirely by letting records handle that, then we get less costful types and that makes the type system shine more. It's not less type safety, it's more type safety because it's more types, it's more variables, it's more thoughts that we have that are put into code because that becomes less cumbersome. <laughs> so anything new on Twitter or? <laughs> not yet. 
Okay. <laughs> now that we got this nice summary about the type safety and about strings, let's come back to another um, problem that we deal in our day-to-day -day life as developers, dealing with data, and see how Project Amber is introducing a new program of paradigm to handle data as data. Some of these concepts, maybe you've heard them yesterday in a familiar talk, but we're gonna discuss a little bit more in detail about dealing with data and the enhancements in Ember now. So, let's take and look at the data-oriented problems that we have as Java developers. We are working with data in a specific format, JSON, XML, events, and many others. And obviously, when we get this information, we want to represent this data in Java. So we would like to represent this data as simple as possible, and we can do that with immutable types. We'll see that soon. We also like to model all the alternatives for our data explicitly, so our system knows more about those. And to make those illegal states that our system doesn't handle irrepresentable, so we don't accidentally model data that we shouldn't. Then we would like to model behavior with functions, model uh, with functions that take input, uh, that take data as input. And we want to deconstruct data easily and quickly. Let's take a closer look to an example of code. So for a GitHub crawler that would look into a GitHub URL and would identify what kind of page is that one and create a page tree based on that URL. So we start with the seed URL and of course, if we would like to create a piece of code, a function that would handle this kind of uh, crawler, we would identify of course the kind of page and follow the links if are any in the, that GitHub page. So we could create a method that's like this one, load page tree that returns a page. But probably many of you wonder like, and how does that page look like? How do you implement it? So let's talk about data representation. As we said in the beginning, in the first iteration, it was like represent data with simple immutable types. And we can do that with records, explained earlier. So these are just a sample of records that we can construct for each of our pages and they have different fields that represent our data as simple as possible. But moreover, we want to model the alternatives and we have to model those explicitly. We can do that thanks to the sealed types uh, to limit the inheritance. So for example, in our case, page can be a sealed interface that permits only error page and successful page to be in inheritance. If we try to introduce another interface that's called my page, for example, then that code will not compile because it's not allowed, everything's sealed. Let's model the alternatives. So in our case, we said that we we're gonna model the alternatives. We start again with a simple page, it's an interface, permits only the error and successful page. But as I said, the GitHub page can be of many types, can be an issue, can be a PR, and many more other. So in this case, the successful page should um, permit extension only to, let's say, external pages and another GitHub page type. And furthermore, down the road, GitHub page type can be GitHub issue page or a GitHub PR page. If you have a little trouble understanding all this hierarchy or it's not very visible from afar because the slide is quite long, we have a picture that shows a little bit more on this class hierarchy. So there in blue, you have the interfaces, which are page, successful page, GitHub page, and upper are the records. This hierarchy is completely sealed. So this means that no new types can be added. Description of a system very easily. Now that we have done this, we model the alternatives. Let's look how, do, how what we do with illegal states. Well, Illegal states are irrepresentable because we combine the sealed types, the records, and we can also use the data validation during construction. This also helps us to make our code more readable. And to represent behavior, we can do that with functions. We can create such a static function that has data as input, and of course, get whatever we need from that data and return a string in our case. But I said polymorphic, right? So it should be more than just a static function. So in that case, the polymorphic behavior would be like this. A page is taken as an input, and based on the type of that page, we have different cases over it, right? So this is just a very nice switch that looks over the H type, makes some manipulations over that, and returns a string. But I have a question for you, just to make sure that you didn't fall asleep. 
Do you see something missing here? Please say it out loud if something's missing. Default, okay, default is missing. Well, that's intended. Brian didn't even know. <laughs> Thank you, but that's a good catch, but that's intended. So in the case of um, uh, the modeling data, we want to have this polymorphic behavior to keep the code as maintainable as possible, but we want to switch over the sealed types. Remember that we have an error key that is sealed. Uh, we enumerate all the possible types and we avoid using default. And some of you are like, okay, so if I add a new GitHub page type, what's gonna happen with my uh, switch? Well, if you don't add a case there, it, the code will not compile. It will tell you like, hey, you have to add me as a case, treat me as a case in your switch, otherwise it will not work. Um, and last but not least, deconstructing data. We need to deconstruct data as easy as possible, and as Nikolai explained earlier, we can use deconstruction patterns for that. So let's just look at these two case branches and um, how they look like. So we see that the error page and uh, the GitHub issue page, they have different fields. But in the case itself, we just need only one of those fields. So wouldn't it be better if we would just have only what is needed? Well, there is a proposal for ignoring data with unnamed patterns. So Jeff443 proposes to use underscore to ignore the components. So in this case, we would use var for URL and ignore the rest in for the first case branch. And of course, underscore, underscore, underscore for the second case where we need only the issue number. Way more readable and I would say way more easier to look into the code. So now we get to the part about data-oriented programming. All these points are part of data-oriented programming where you can use Java to model data, particularly to represent data as data using records, to uh, model the alternatives using seal types, to have methods to model the behavior, use switch without any defaults, and of course pattern matching to the structure on polymorphic data. But data-oriented programming isn't a replacement for functional programming. We still need functional programming. I know that data-oriented programming is similar to functional programming. It works with data and functions, but the, in this case, the first priority is data, not the functions. And of course, we still need object-oriented programming because probably all of us have learned Java as a Java object-oriented programming model because that one helps us to modularize the large systems, but data-oriented programming helps us to model small data-focused systems. You can find out more about this in the article wrote, written by Brian Gutz for InfoQ. You can look into the code that's available on GitHub and more on YouTube about data-oriented programming and each of the topics discussed today. And of course, there's a talk of Nikolai from yesterday that will be published on DevOps channel. So give that a try as well. Gonna leave a little more for people to take pictures. We're gonna share the slides anyway. To summarize, object-oriented programming is still the core starting with Java development, but isn't the best fit for all the situations. So that's why Project Ember is trying to introduce new features that help you unlock data-oriented programming and make more with functional programming and that make it more approachable. Okay, so if you've been there yesterday and you got this summary, you have zero excuse for not passing the test later, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and you can now wake up again Let's talk about something new. We're going to talk about how Project Amber paves the on-ramp for new Java developers or for new developers in general. So we all know Java IDEs, build tools, Gradle, Maven, all of that stuff, right? Do we though? I know there's at least one person here that might not know all of those, and I bet that there are more. And then what about your kids, for example? They probably don't know Gradle that good, that well. What about students who want to switch over and see Eclipse or IntelliJ for the first time? What about front-end developers who's already experienced developers but want to change into a new environment and are immediately bombarded with a lot of things in, in Java space? What about the machine learning and AI folks? They're currently using a lot of Python and I hear that's like just a one-liner to get started and that seems very important. Uh, so maybe there would be a good way to get those uh, to consider Java more seriously if Java also had like just an easier on-ramp because Java needs to stay approachable. It needs to be able to interest new, new generation of developers to actually start using it. I mean, many of us in this room are already old, 
we don't want to feel like, you know, be like dying out and then nobody uses Java anymore, right? So what do you need, exactly, we don't want to run COBOL. So what do you need to uh, write and run a simple Java program? Well, the JDK, obviously, right? And then you need an editor. Well, you could use an IDE, of course. You need the compiler or a build tool, or again, IDE would help. Well, executing it, also an IDE would help. So at this point, it seems like the IDE is the answer. But again, I remember the first time I opened Eclipse, I wanted to cry. <laughs> so <laughs> and even Visual Studio Code, it's not like, well, okay, I know everything works. You need to install plugins and configure stuff. It's gotten easier, but it's far from being perfect. Also, you probably need some Java code, right? So let's start with some Java code. Public class, main, public static, void, main, string, bracket, bracket, arc, system, or print, hello world. So that's like, I don't know, let's say it's like one and a half dozen words. So what, pr what concepts are in those words hidden? So what's the first one? What's that about? Excellent. Right, visibility, yes, this one. And then classes, methods. What's static? Oof. <laughs> took me like, I think that alone took me like two years to understand. What are returns? What are parameters? What are statements? What are arguments? This is like almost every word is its own concept that you can like, that's, there's a Wikipedia article on each of those, right? So it's not exactly easy to get started with. So that's a lot of tools and concepts to understand. And Java is great for large-scale development because of its detailed tool chain, because of its refined programming model. But these exact strengths, like having gazillion libraries for every use case, frameworks, IDEs, build tools, having so much choice in all of these individual steps that makes it amazing for the job that we do every day, make it horrible to start with it, right? It makes like you have choice every step of the way and you have no idea how to figure those things out. So this makes Java less approachable and we need to change that, we need to work on that. So the first step in that direction, arguably, was JShell. Java 9 added JShell, which uh, you can just, you know, it's like a REPL, read, eval, print loop. You just start on your command line JShell, and then you just start writing Java code. So all the tools are out the window, just use JDK and JShell, and all you need is statements and arguments. This is a great way to write small parts of Java. But my personal opinion is, and that's really like this, this separates me from many of my colleagues at Oracle, I think, I don't think it's good for beginners. Like I only use JShell when I kind of know what I want to do because I got like syntax highlighting, like nobody wants to have code completion with like, anyway, I think it's good when I know I want to try this one stream method, but I don't think it's a great way to start learning the language, uh, honestly. And more importantly, there's no progression. So let's say you did create a few things that you want to keep. It's not easy to get those pieces and not everything, all the other crap that you wrote out of there and store it and reload it later. So definitely more is needed. Single file execution was added in Java 11. That allowed us to throw a Java file at the runtime, at the launcher, right? There's no Java C in here. Just write a single file, throw it at Java, and we'll just compile the memory and start. That only removes Java C from the chain, but that's actually a big step because it removes like this necessity to learn where to put files and how to then put files into the Java command line. It makes things easier to get started, but again, there was no progression. It was just that. You have a single source file, and as soon as you want to leave the single source file, you had to like start basically with a build tool or whatever. And also, you had to still know public, static, void, and all that stuff. So the idea bit Amr now is to expand that on RAM into both directions. On the one hand, to make it even simpler to start with code, and on the other hand, to start going from single files to multiple files before you eventually start uh, to create a proper project. So to s for simpler code, the idea is to remove a ton of requirements. The first one is the string args parameter. If you don't actually need arguments, why have that, right? So that can go out the window. Why does main have to be static? If this class is a simple class, it probably has a no argument constructor, the launcher can just instantiate it and then call main on that. That gets rid of static, which is a huge, either it's like, don't, please ignore this, I'm gonna explain it to you like in three years, or it's a huge, huge learning hurdle. Um, the main or the class don't need to be public. Package visibility is okay. We can, these, if these are in the unnamed package, right, if they don't have a package, we can make an exception and say, apparently you don't care about packages, so we don't need to care about package or buff package visibility either. This is a little bit more radical. Why not kick out the class itself too? And that you end up with this. This would be all the code that would be in proc Java. Void main, system or print line. And there's even argument to giving static imports for this. So that's, oh, I hear like the whispering, oh my God, it's like, it's Python. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's void main and write your code. And there was a big discussion about what about methods though? We could go even lower, maybe just start here, but this expands naturally into real program. I'll show you that in a second. 
there's a JEP draft for this, which is very, very early. So lots of people think about stuff, then they create a draft. That draft can evolve over years, can even die. And maybe it becomes a JEP, and then it becomes a preview. So this is like very, very early. This is no promise of this being a feature ever. It's just let's hope that it will be at some point. The other direction is run multiple files. Say you have a folder like this one, which has proc Java, but also helper.java, and then maybe a library folder with a simple library that you downloaded. I'm saying simple because you know, nobody wants to manually download Spring Boot and all its dependencies, but if it's like Apache Commons or something, it's doable. And you could run this like this. You say, okay, the class path is this, run proc.java, and the first time proc Java references helper.java, the, 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 the Java launcher checks, okay, I'm in this folder, can I find a helper Java file? Oh, I can, good, let's keep going. Again, jab draft for that. And that would give you a natural progression, right? Imagine you start with void main, system or print and hello world. That's, that's the first step that you take. And then if you need arguments that you want to pass in from the outside, you know, add the args file, add the args argument. If you want to organize your code, if like it became a little bit too long, now's a good time to, in, to learn about how to create methods, how to define methods, how to define return types, and all that good stuff. If you, want to need, if you need to share state, you can actually add fields. So this, this code that I showed you earlier, which was just the main, you can add fields on top of that. And this is what I meant, like it naturally expands into a, uh, into a real class. If you need more functionality, go into JDK APIs. They're all available, right? You can have imports as well. If you need even more, as I said, you can use simple libraries. You can just download them, put them into the, well, it's not that easy that anymore to download them without a build tool. Um, but you can get those, dump them into the lib folder, and go ahead. If you need even more structure, you can start creating multiple files. And then you can go into visibility and packages. And at that point, you've learned a lot about Java. And you've learned it when you needed it, which is by far the best way to teach and to learn. To let somebody experiment, and then when they're at the point of now I need this, that's the time to explain. And it doesn't even need to be this order, right? Many of these things can be done in another order. And once you've done all of that, you know so much Java, now is a good time to sit you down and tell you, well, look, I've been lying to you. There is such a thing as a compiler. You maybe need to build a jar, take a deep breath, and open IntelliJ. You know. So then, then from there, you eventually have to introduce some tools. So what this tries to do is to take Java's strengths of large-scale development that make it less approachable and simplify those to give you an on-ramp where you can start simple and then gradually progress towards full-fledged Java. And with that, entice the future generation of Java developers. OK, now it's time for the test that I was threatening. Let me see whether I can get this to work. Yeah, he's going to code, and I'm going to help you if you need help to solve the test. That's how it's going to work. OK, there we are. Let's quickly look at the code. So this is uh, code that works on Java, I don't even know. I think 11 or something. It doesn't even use var, right? So it's probably pretty old. Mm -hmm. It does this. You say world, and it figures out that you want to say hello world, and you say, want to say it three times, so it prints three times hello world. How does it do that? There's a little main method here. And um, look, you can see it's actual real life code because there's a to-do of stuff that still needs to be done. Um, this one parses the arguments. And then we have this classes that represent the arguments. We have a class that represents the greeting. We have a class of that represents the unimplemented echo because I think I've learned yesterday in the keynote that I need, uh, like I need to plan for the future and write all the code that I may need at some point. <laughs> Did I get this? Yes. Victor, that, Victor taught me that, yes. right? Yes. Okay, I quote him on this. So you have, yeah. Okay, now it's your turn. Uh, let's start with the stuff that actually works in 21. So everything I mentioned, that's a jab in the you future. You some time to read the code. Oh, okay. You know it by heart, but maybe I too, but. We accept any answers to improve mm -hmm. this code. Only correct answers. I mean, we, ex we <laughs> process the answer, <laughs> I'm trying to say. Okay, do you see anything that could be, but something could be applied that we just talked about? Yeah. It's louder a bit. Somebody said remove some boilerplate code. Um, I mean, yeah. Can you be more specific? <laughs> Right, I said I can remove those, right? But that's, that's like down the road feature. We're gonna do that later, so let's put a to-do here. <laughs> <laughs> remove. 
public. Yes, we're preparing for the future. Status. <laughs> Besides this, we still want for the code to print hello world with this complexity. So but I think somebody mentioned something about instance of, didn't they hear yeah. that somewhere? There we go. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There's this. Good. Okay. So it works? Yes. Nice. Good. Exactly. So we, what we do? We used a uh, type pattern. What else? There's another thing. <laughs> text yeah, blocks. Exactly. Text blocks. Perfect. So it's this. Hello, this. And then, because we're doing the stuff that actually works, uh, we have to use formats, yes? Mm -hmm. That's good, but that's for later, because it's still... That doesn't exist yet, unfortunately. Uh, use uh, string templates. Yes. Right, that was... Oh, that's a to-do. To-do, and add the comment for the text blocks. All oh right, we did a text block. Are the original ones here? Do they also Yes. So a bunch of code here. So for example, I can Can you still read it now? Because now we can see a little bit more code. Okay. Record. Yes. Okay. okay, let's start a record. You can already start thinking about the next one because it will take a while. So records are so great that it, I can remove so much code. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay, so this is the interesting one. I'm going to use what's called a compact constructor. We're not going to explain it, but I can do this. The fields will be assigned later. This works. It just checks whether the command is not null, and then later it assigns everything. So this is all that remains. What is reading? I'm using uh, not a uh, proper IDE, by the way, or not like even here, I didn't install the plugins for, for Java. Because we're later going to do stuff that n none of those plugins would understand, and I don't want them to yell at me and not come, you know. So I'm shy, so I don't want, I want them to be yeah, nice. Yeah, only Nikolai can yell. Um, syntax that can go away. Mm. I think that's it. Let's see. No, oh, record. No, no. Yes. Yeah. All right, the vectors are automatically static. So a class, an inner class, has a reference to the outer class. You need to write static class so it doesn't. But this one always, records always don't. Oh, we, wow. I mean, no ID support and it compiled on first try. Am I compiling the right file? Because <laughs> this sounds unbelievable. We have Who does this? Who breaks their code intentionally to see whether they're working on the right things? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Not the only one. Okay, it's the right file though. Okay, what else? So records, did you see how much code went away? And like we didn't, it's, it's not harder to read. It just went away. Okay, I think we got one more thing for you. Mm, two more. Yeah. Oh yeah, we can even use reconstruction here, right? Like here, we can turn the greeting because we only need, what is it? The audience, right? Yes. All right, so it's a type pattern. Actually, we can use a record pattern. So we turn to this greeting into let's have an audience here instead. And let's remove that. And this now should fail because we're now using a preview feature. So we're gonna say enable preview source 21 and it works again. Unbelievable. Okay, so that was... And there's one more. Somebody said var? Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. there's some room for vars. Yeah. Um, I think like, actually <laughs> that was all the room for vars. I think. Okay, I got one more. That is true, right? So that's perfect argument. Parse arguments. That's much better. Or parse two arguments, maybe even. I mean, not not two in the sense like maybe this. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I didn't plan this, but yes, use var wisely. This might not have been a wise use because we don't know what parse to argument returns. Now it's maybe a little bit clearer, but you know, 
uh, well-intentioned people can disagree on this. Yeah. Okay, there's one more that's not actually amber, and that's so it's a little bit cheating, but I'm still going to deduct it from your um, from join. We could, we could create a stream, but did you know that we have this in Java now? This is real rocket science. So we can now actually repeat a string a couple of times, and we don't need a loop for that. Uh, static arguments, did I? Oh, right, yeah, no, sorry, there's the opening. I'm not a fan, like, okay, technically there should be an opening and a closing curly brace, I don't like those. Okay, I think we got all the things done um, that we can use in Java 21, right? Mm, yes, okay. but there were some wishes there, like some to-dos. Right, we could use string templates. Let's start with those. So with string templates, uh, we can put the audience here, right, in the future, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's that part? Yeah. And... Oh, that is true. So this would work, right? No, this would not work. No, it will not work. Something's missing. Yeah. And what are you saying? Something else is missing. Yeah, I think there's probably more optimization here, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at the, ha at the fancy feature, right? SDR. Oh, right, the STR is missing, though. Thank you. Okay, we had this, right? We can remove the public static. Yeah. So then we can also remove, or we kind of need to remove the static here, right? Well, we don't need to, actually, but, you know, we might as well, since we're making it simpler. Mm -hmm. What else? The simpler, the simpler launch protocol allow, allowed us to not only remove the public and the static, there was something else that we could remove, something kind of big. The switching and we, okay, so we could write a switch here, and if we start implementing the echo, that will probably be helpful. But I think for now we're good, since you know this to do is still open. But something related to the exactly, we can remove the class, right? So we can do this, and that's this. Uh, so we got to remove public okay. static. We've done that. Text blocks. Do you know what? The indentation of this. Ah, ha, let me show you this. I was just thinking the indentation of this is wonky. I want this to be intended, indented one more time. Do you know what this changes about the string? Nothing. Because all this indentation is just my code indentation. And the compiler can figure out which is which. I'm not going to explain to you how. If you're wondering, ask me later. Um, but uh, this is really good. So text blocks, and we use uh, string templates too. I think we got it, right? Yeah. Let's see. Now we can't run this anymore, unfortunately. But you gotta say, got a bit simpler. It's less code. It's easier to start with. I mean, this used a bunch of stuff, right? Like instance of checks that you would don't want to present to a beginner. But even to a beginner, I think this is a little bit more approachable than what it was initially. And yeah, you don't need to scroll anymore to see the entire code. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we were here, I think. Yes. So, probably now you're feeling inspired about all these previews. We have Wait. used. We, 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 we missed something. What? Here, the deconstruction pattern. Look. We can say arguments. Okay. Var repetitions. Repetition. Oh my god. Now, now my poo is leaving me. Var command. And then, you know. Okay, sorry, like it was. <laughs> Not essential, maybe, but so like such a cool feature. We presented it. You might as well use it, right? There we go. Okay. Now, if all of you like old-time Java developers wonder, like, holy shit, I can't read this anymore. Well, welcome. That's like what the newbies feel like too. <laughs> so it's a big change in the language, like all of these put together. Um, but I think all of those are like lambdas. You will use them for a couple of weeks, months, and they will become natural. Okay, I need to shut up apparently. Getting okay. side glance. <laughs> okay. Side eye. Sorry. So. You have seen in action how we have used var, text blocks, records, type record patterns, and Amber can do many more than this. We, can, we, can, we have used the construction assignments, we have used string templates and simpler main. So our code is not just shorter, but is way more readable. To summarize, Project Amber is doing all that that, we, that you saw, that we worked on together, 
and more. It has a relaxed this super protocol. It's a JEP draft again. Another JEP draft on the concise meta bodies and a serialization revamp that's on design notes. So we have all the links there. I'm gonna share the slides. So we hope you do a deeper dive in this. To summarize, Project Ember is the solution factory to Java's problems. There are the slides. Thank you for listening to us. And I think there are a few more things to be said by our hosts. Oh.